This is the Exam Room Podcast brought to you by the Physicians Committee with the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thanks for giving the show a listen, a download, wherever it is that you're streaming us. Thank you so very much for being here. You know, we aim to both educate and enlighten and have a whole lot of fun. And today's topic is one that, uh, well, Americans, we're by and large just obsessed with bacon. We are a bacon-obsessed nation. And here at the Physicians Committee, we have a campaign right now called Break Up With Bacon, because my next guest will be the first to tell you that you may love bacon, but bacon necessarily does not love you back. With that, we welcome Dr. Neil Barnard to the show. Welcome. Thank you, Chuck. Good to see you. It is great to be here. I have a question for you. Yep. Bacon is a four and a half billion dollar industry in the U.S. annually. Just bacon. Why is it that we love bacon so much? What is it about it that makes us crave it? Yeah, well, you know, you said it, Chuck. Uh, people love bacon, doesn't love them back. What the heck is it about it? I think there are really two things. I call it the potato chip effect and the drug effect. Here's what I, here's what I mean. Okay. The potato chip effect means that if there's any food that has a combination of salt and grease, Mm -hmm. we get hooked. Right. So that's uh, potato chips, onion rings, french fries. The salt triggers the release of dopamine in the brain. And somehow, if it's not just salt, but salt in a greasy food, it it seems to amplify that effect. The same is true with sugary, fatty things, um, like a donut. People like the sugar-grease combination more than they like just sugar itself. So... That's the potato chip effect. It's a mixture of salt and grease. Bacon's got salt and it's got grease. No question. The drug effect is something different. And the way we know about this is with we use a medication called Narcan, right. naloxone. It's used in the emergency mm-hmm. room for, for heroin overdose. Mm-hmm. So Hank has uh, got his new shipment of heroin, and um, he doesn't realize that it is twice as powerful as last week's shipment. And he shoots up, and in a couple of minutes, he is face down in the gutter, and his friends all know what's going to happen, which is Hank is going to die right? Um, because he's overdosed. So they take his limp body to the emergency room where what we do is we inject Narcan. And Narcan, or naloxone, goes to the brain, and it, it attaches to the same receptors that heroin would attach to. It knocks the heroin off, and you save his life. Okay, so let's say you've got a bacon lover. And if you give, and not just bacon, but other kinds of meat too, you give them an injection of Narcan. And what you discover is amazing. Uh, you can you can give them a whole tray of bacon, and they just don't eat it. You're kidding. Uh, or, I mean, they, they might take a little bit, but they don't take as much as they were taking before. And by the way, this is not a, a treatment. <laughs> this, no. <laughs> this, is, this is not the cure for baconology. Um, but this what this is, it's about, um, it's a research tool that helps us separate the, the I like it, I like the taste and mouthfeel, versus there's some brain effect that's going on. And what we have found in, in looking at other foods is you see this effect with chocolate. That a person who thinks, I just love the aroma of chocolate. If you mm-hmm. give them Narcan, they like chocolate a whole lot less wow. because it's got a brain, a central nervous system stimulating action. And you inject somebody with bacon, they eat less. So what do we got? The potato chip effect means I like anything that's salty and greasy. And I like things that stimulate somehow the opiate machinery in the brain. You put those together in one food. And the sales go go, uh, go crazy. So that's that's what it is with bacon. Yeah, bacon's definitely going to check off both of those boxes, salty and greasy. Probably check them both twice. Well, just imagine. What if you had bacon that didn't have any saltiness at all? People wouldn't like it as much. What if it was completely fat-free? Uh, people wouldn't like it as much. What if it didn't do anything to your brain? They wouldn't, they wouldn't go for it. So the whole reason that bacon is going across the cash register uh, at every grocery store there is is because it's got all those elements. It's got the salty, greasy potato chip effect. It's also got the drug effect. All right. Well, let me ask you this. I think that somebody might be listening to this and say, well, okay, bacon, probably not the healthiest food ever. But if I eat just a little bit, that's not going to hurt me, right? Um, the most charitable thing you could say is that any move that you make to reduce your consumption of really unhealthy foods, that's a good move. Right. So when a person cuts down, great. But this is what we call dose-related, meaning it's not like on or off. Um, if you... Um, if, if, if a person eats less bacon, their risk of colorectal cancer or cardiovascular disease or breast cancer, their risk will drop. 
And if they cut bacon more, their risk drops more. And if they cut it out completely, their risk drops to the lowest level that it can be with regard to that exposure. So in other words, if you're asking, is there some safe level of bacon? If I just eat a little bit, uh, will I be okay? The answer is no. Um, it's one of those things where the less you have of it, the better. It's just like tobacco, same story. Um, if I cut down to just like a half a pack, is that better than a pack? Absolutely, it's better. But if I don't smoke at all, is that better than a half pack a day? Yes, <laughs> yeah, uh, for, for sure. Um, because people used to say that about tobacco too. Sure. Um, what if I just cut down? Is that good? Yeah, it's kind of halfway sort of a little good, but it's nothing like quitting. Yeah, yeah. I think that bacon, though, it's, it's one of those foods that it's it's hard to cut down on. I mean, as you and I have talked at length on this show, it's like food addiction is something that I'm very familiar with and millions of people struggle with. And it's like that old advertisement. I think it was for potato chips. I bet you can't eat just one. You know, who can yeah. eat just one strip of bacon? I remember growing up as a kid and, you know, mom would fry up the bacon or grandma would fry up the bacon and we would all be allotted, you know, two or three pieces, however much we had that morning. And then there would be a fight over, well, who could get that third piece? Who could get that fourth piece? It's so hard to put down. Don't I know it? It, it is one of these things that people just crave until you start to look at what it really means. Right. Um, because whether you're talking about human health, what the animals go through, what the environment is going through as a result of this trade, uh, once we learn about those things, it's kind of pretty easy to sure to, to break up a bacon. Sure. Let's let's talk about the toll that it can take on human health. You know, you poke around um, on PCRM.org or even with the World Health Organization classifying processed meat, ergo bacon, as a class one carcinogen. You know then that there's going to be a strong link between that and cancer. And specifically, I want to ask you about the link between bacon and colorectal and prostate cancers. How strong is that connection? Uh, yeah, this is where... <laughs> The World Health, or World Health Organization, as you know, came out in 2015 and said, basically, believe it. Um, bacon is what they call a class one carcinogen. And that's uh, an, uh, a classification based on the strength of evidence. What they meant is, as sure as we are that tobacco causes lung cancer, we are that sure that bacon causes colorectal cancer. In other mm. words, it's not just an association or, or maybe it causes it. There's just no doubt. And that was 2015, but eight years before that, the American Institute for Cancer Research and the World Cancer Research Fund reached essentially the same conclusion. So this is not new at all. It's news to people having a BLT, but it's not new to the science world. We have known for a long time that there's a reason why this second leading cancer killer is growing among young people. Sure. It's, it's it's all because of bacon and and and, and you know and sausage and ham and the, the other foods in that category. So um, the reason that that bacon causes colorectal cancer, a couple of things actually. One is that when when meat products in general go down the digestive tract, they alter the gut bacteria. It's sort of like I'm planting a garden, but now I'm going to use a completely different kind of soil, different weeds or seeds start to grow. If you're suddenly putting a lot of processed meat down, and frankly, even non-processed meat mm -hmm. like red meat uh, or chicken down your digestive tract, a different kind of bacterial species will grow. Those bacteria in turn create carcinogenic compounds oh. in your digestive tract. That's number one. Uh, number two is that bacon may contain carcinogens itself. Um, there's a lot of parts of it that we're concerned about. It's not unique. I didn't mean to say that turkey bacon is is uh, off the hook. N not at all. Turkey bacon is bacon. Right. Uh, it, it's linked to colorectal cancer, just like pork bacon. Uh, what about uh, for, for women, breast cancer? This is one that when I was doing a little bit of research for the show, this one kind of caught me by surprise a little bit. You know, you, I had heard about the link between uh, the colorectal and the prostate cancer previously, but not necessarily to breast cancer. How does bacon play a role in that? Uh, first of all, let, let me be clear. We know this to be the case. Um, okay. it, this is not just a theory or a hypothesis. Okay. There has been uh, not one, but at least two solid meta-analyses of all the previous data, crunching all the numbers, and there is a clear-cut relationship between processed meat consumption, especially bacon and sausage and others, um, and breast cancer. Um, and here, I think the issue, th there's, again, two issues. One is carcinogens. Sure. A cancer-causing chemical um, tends to hit breast cells uh, 
the breast cells are very fragile. Mm -hmm. They are sensitive to carcinogens that might be circulating in the blood. There's another part of it, and that is that the breast cells are sensitive to estrogens, female sex hormones. Right. And when women consume fattier foods and more meat, their estrogen levels tend to rise a little bit. Um, that's because these foods uh, don't have any fiber in them. You need fiber to get rid of excess estrogens. Um, and so the processed meats do increase the risk, not just of breast cancer uh, and uh, colorectal cancer, as we mentioned, also esophageal cancer, pancreatic cancer, other forms of the disease. Right. Even lung cancer, a little bit. It's uh, surprising. You know, you're not inhaling the bacon. Right. Um, it's uh, probably the carcinogens that are circulating in the blood. So we're talking about carcinogens, but obviously bacon is also something that's going to be high in cholesterol. And right. cholesterol also has a strong tie to heart disease one then could assume that there's a correlation between bacon consumption and an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Uh, without question, and it's kind of a perfect storm because uh, bacon has cholesterol, as animal products do. It's also very fatty. Mm -hmm. That's what people love about it. That's why after they cook it, there's all that grease in the pan, uh, which then if you leave the pan, sit there for, and let it cool down, mm -hmm. and it turns into this gelatinous goo. Uh, it's like Vaseline. That's in your arteries. Yeah. Um, that saturated fat, that solid fat, stimulates your body to make extra cholesterol, and that in turn will attack the arteries. But back to the salt thing, the salt will raise your blood pressure, as does the fatty part of it. It makes the blood more viscous, more thick. Uh, that makes the circulation harder, harder and harder. Um, all these together basically spell heart disease. You know, and, and that makes perfect sense to me because you say that and I just, I always think back to my grandma's kitchen and always, inevitably on top of the stove was this little glass jar. I think that it was an old, uh, old jar of Sanka. You remember Sanka, the instant <laughs> coffee? She had yeah. taken the label off and she would fill it with excess bacon grease. And then she would use that for whatever other dish she was going to make. It didn't matter if she was making grits. It didn't matter if she was making green beans. Like bacon grease was going in it. It didn't matter. But there it was, that gelatinous goo sitting on top of the stove. And so now you think about it and you're like, man, that is now kind of in my arteries and that that's that buildup that we that we all please yes chuck but you've been following a healthy diet i have maybe it's gone i have maybe it's gone i would like to think so my mother did the same thing yeah my, my mom had five kids and we would wake up to the smell of bacon we'd come downstairs and mom would have taken all the bacon strips out put it on the paper towel to cool down and there was all that grease left in the mm. the, the pan you don't throw that out Mm -mm. She would pour it into a jar, and the jar never went into the refrigerator. She would just put it on the shelf because as, you, as it cools down, it solidifies. And the fact that it's solid at room temperature, I mean, you can tell from 100 yards that's not corn oil or um, it's not a vegetable oil. Right. The fact that it's solid is a sign it's high in saturated fat. In fact, let me give you a little quick tip. Sure. Um, saturated fat is the one that raises cholesterol. Okay. Um, it also, by the way, is linked to Alzheimer's disease. Really? Yes, okay. and you can see it. Um, on your counter, it's solid. It's solid at room temperature. If you have a vegetable oil, like corn oil or soybean oil, um, they are um, liquid at room temperature. And they are high in polyunsaturates. So saturates versus unsat unsaturates. And this will not be on the test, but here's one more. Olive oil is high in monounsaturates, and they are liquid on your counter and solid in your fridge. Hmm. That's how you can tell the difference. If it's liquid both places, polyunsaturated. If it's solid both places, bad, bad saturated fat. And if it's solid in the fridge, liquid on the shelf, that's mono. That's olive oil. There you go. Huh. Oil 101 here on the bacon. There you show. go. I like it. I won't charge you anything extra for that, Chuck. Uh, man, well, I appreciate that. <laughs> If you liked what you just saw on this video, be sure to subscribe to our channel, leave a nice comment below. And oh, by the way, did you know that the Exam Room Podcast, also available wherever fine podcasts are available, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, go ahead and subscribe there as well. And if you would be so kind as to leave us a five-star rating, we would greatly appreciate it.